when you were a, a young girl, you, you talked about this magic pencil, this character who had a magic pencil and that could change the world, and that this was your sort of first image in your imagination of what you could do to change the world. I loved uh, watching uh, dramas and uh, TV serials on TV, and especially the Indian dramas. And one of them was Shakalaka Boom Boom. And that was about a boy, and uh, his name is Sanju, and he has got a magic pencil. And whatever he draws comes into reality. If he wants a car, he can have it. But usually he helped people. And uh, I also wanted to have the same pencil, and I wanted to become, uh, I wanted to have magic, the power of magic. And I also watched the uh, Sonpari. It was another uh, fairy. She had a stick in it. She could also do magic. So I was really crazy for magic. And I, uh, and I used to pray to God in every prayer that, oh, God, give me that magic pencil. I'm not going to tell anyone. Just keep it in that cupboard, and I'll just take it out, and I'll... But that was only a dream. But now I have realized that uh, the magic pencil that Sanju had was really magical. Oh. And that's why now I'm having a pencil in my hand to fight for my rights, to fight for the rights of every girl. Yeah, because you have talked about that image a lot, haven't you? When you were in the UN, and again, when you won one of the prizes I saw a couple of weeks ago, you talked very specifically about the power of the pencil to change the world. So, I mean, can you just talk a little bit about when it, I mean, your father, who is also I mean, a great campaigner for children's rights, for people's rights, and for girls' rights. Um, but Zawadin said to me last year, when he was part, came to the, for the Women of the World Festival, that he absolutely had always had this passion for committing himself to girls' education. And you were his firstborn. And therefore, you presumably joined in the, um, the mission very early on. Was it something that you also felt personally? I mean, did it, did it strike you very early on that girls needed to have magic pencils in real life? At that time, when terrorism was spreading in Swat, and when the Taliban came to Swat, they started blowing schools. They blasted more than 400 schools in Swat. They also killed people, they slaughtered women, they flogged women. They were against the basic rights of women. They were against the freedom of women. Women were not allowed to go to market. We were not allowed to go to school even. So at that hard situation, he was speaking up for his rights. My father raised his voice. And he was not afraid of anyone. And he was doing it very honestly. And with his courage and with his full determination, he carried on. And that's why... Um, I followed him and I learned from him and uh, I think a boy could also have raised his voice at that time but the, the education of boys was not that much hard as girls education was because the Taliban did not ban boys education otherwise my brothers would also have spoken but uh, but at that time I was speaking because I wanted to go to school I loved my books I loved my school bag I loved my school and I was and I was missing my school because before the terrorism, I was thinking that carrying this heavy bag to school and having lots of books and doing homework every day, why am I going to school? Is it important? What, what, has, what, what importance does it have in my life? But later on, when I saw the terrorists, when they came to Swat and when they banned girls' education, then I realized that these terrorists are afraid of the the power of education, and they're not letting women to be empowered. That's why they are stopping us from going to school. You, were very, you are very academic, and you're very competitive. I mean, in the book, I'm full of, of uh, admiration for the fact that you're saying, I didn't come first. This is very annoying. I will come first next time. And you, you're very open about the fact that, you know, between the different friends you have, you're very competitive, and if somebody new arrives and they might get first in class, you'll work even harder. So you're obviously a very driven person academically. And one of the really startling images I had was when you were, re you were reading Stephen Hawkins' brief, um, a brief history, history of time, time at the same time as the Taliban were burning down the schools. And that, those images together, you know, it must have felt as if you were living in a very bizarre world where you had access to, to global education. And, then, and yet everybody was allowing this situation to happen with very few people standing up against them. We believe that every day we are progressing, we are developing, 
But in Swat, we were in a reverse mood. We were going back every day. We were going back to the Stone Age. In this 21st century, we believed that even now we are giving education to special children, to disabled children. But in our part of the world, we girls were banned from going to schools. And we felt like we have been just thrown to the Stone Age. And we could see the barbaric situation. It was really hard to live in that situation. And I loved my school. I wanted to get education. I wanted to see peace in Swat. I, want to, I wanted to read about Stephen Hawking. I wanted to read about time. I wanted to know about physics. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go out of the universe and see other worlds. But that right was snatched from us. We were only limited to the four walls of our house. We were told that the only job for a woman is to cook, is to serve her husband, is to serve her father, her brothers, is to clean the house, is to give birth to children, is to feed them. That's her job. That's why she has been, that's why she has been created. That's the mindset of those terrorists. In the Quran, you talk about the fact that there's nothing that says that women should be dependent on men. I mean, you quote as, uh, parts of the Quran that says very specifically, actually, women are very independent. In fact, the first wife of the Prophet was 15 years older than him and a professional woman, is what you say? The first wife of Prophet, peace be upon him, was a widow. Mm -hmm. She was 15 years older than him. She was doing trade. Uh, doing exports, exports and imports, and she was a businesswoman. And Prophet was helping her. Prophet was working with her in her business. And Islam shows us that there is no difference between a man and a woman. They have the equal rights. They have the same rights. And if we look at the hadith of Prophet, peace be upon him, he says... That it is the duty, not only the right, it's the duty of every man and woman, of every girl and boy, to get knowledge and to get education. But I think that the terrorists uh, haven't read Quran and neither they have read the Hadith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would be useful to land that all at the terrorist's door, but culturally, that, that attitude, and not just with regard to the Quran, travels across many countries in many ways. And there are lots of things, we were talking before, your family and myself, about the, 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 the cultural problems that women are facing still, to do with uh, forced marriages, to do with uh, attitudes towards the idea of, of possession, of, you know, etc. Do you imagine that the, the, the um, position that you're now taking on girls' education, do you think that is the, the answer to unlocking all of those things? If we look at the world and what's happening and why women are suffering, why girls are suffering, there are so many facts, not only terrorism. They're suffering from child labor, from child trafficking, from early forced marriages, they're suffering from the cultural norms and taboos as well that are against their rights. And there's another thing in our society, being a Pashtun and being a Muslim. We sometimes love Islam, we follow the rules of Islam, and sometimes we follow the rules of Pashtun society. Islam says that if you find a girl having a sexual relationship with a boy, then you need four witnesses to prove that. And then you can have the punishment or anything else. You need four witnesses. But according to the Pashtun laws, you can kill her. You don't need any witness. And that's what we are doing. Mm -hmm. In the case of Parda, we follow Islam. But in the case of killing women, in honor killing, then we follow Pashtun culture, the taboos of the Pashtun society. I'm not saying that we Pashtuns are bad or, or cultures are bad. 
We are very famous for our hospitality. We are brave. And I'm proud to be a Pashtun, but there are so many things in our society that we need to change. If you ask people, they would say, no, this is our culture, and that's why I'm doing this. But we are the one who made the culture, and then we are the one who can change it. And that's, uh, that's what I believe. I made a culture. Now it's against the human rights. It's against women's rights. That's the time to change it now. So we must love our culture. We must love our traditions. But the traditions that are against our rights, we must deny them and we must change them. We must never follow them. You've been a, a, a passionate activist since, I don't know, probably about 10 or 11. Um, I mean, you started your blog when, how old were you then? Were you 11 then? Yes, I was 11. 11. Um, and you won Pakistan's first peace prize before you were shot. I mean, this was something that you were already seen as a, a, a national and international activist. And, and you say in your book that when I mean, you talk about politics generally, and you obviously became more and more political, but you say that you've decided to become a politician when you became a displaced person. At, at a certain point, the situation in the Swat Valley got so bad that your families all, you, you all had to leave. Millions of people left. So what was it about that experience that made you decide to become a politician? When I was in Swat, I, was, I wanted to become a doctor because women in Swat and, in, and in, in such societies where women are not accepted as, you, as humans even, then women have two choices, and especially in our society. They can either be a doctor or a teacher if they get education. I was going to school and everyone uh, in my classroom was saying they wanted to become a doctor, and the same was I. I also said that I want to become a doctor. And, uh, but then later on, when I saw terrorism, when we were displaced, we had to leave our home in Swat, and we did not know where we are going. And we did not know, are we going back to our house or not? But still, for the, we sacrificed, we sacrificed, and we left our area just for peace, because we wanted to see peace in, in Swat. And we were being displaced because of the military operation that was happening in Swat. But when I went out of Swat, and at that time I said, Malala, now you need to, to take an action. And usually, people tell me, why don't you become a journalist, or why don't you choose another job? But in my opinion, having a banner in your hand and standing in front of the parliament mm -hmm. and saying that I want education, I want to fight for my rights, I want to bring that change in the constitution, I want to do this and that. Instead of st standing in front of the parliament, why don't you go inside? Why don't you go inside the parliament and bring the changes that you want? So that's why instead of being asking the politicians I want to go there, I want to go to the parliament, and I want to bring that change. So for serving my country, for helping the children of Pakistan to go to school, for helping every child all around the world, those 57 million children who are out of school, I want to join politics. Because now all these issues that we are facing, the terrorism and the, and the war and the hard situation that is going on, the politicians and the the, the leaders of the countries, they can take an action for it. Why don't, why don't they solve it? Why don't they focus on it? Why don't they give importance to education? Yeah, well, let me come back to the politics in, in a minute, because I want to ask you more about that. But yes, why don't they? Because the Millennium Goals you know, were very, very clearly set up. But the ones that have dropped to the bottom seem to be the ones that specifically are about girls' education, women's health, etc. Why do you think that is? Why is that agenda kept dropping to the bottom of The first thing is that usually we have meetings in, uh, in conferences and uh, we talk with other people, but we just talk to the, like I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you as well, but what about those people who are living in Swat? What about, those, what about those parents who are not letting their daughters to school? We need to go and we need to talk to them as well. 
So, so instead of having meetings in Islamabad, in a big cities, in New York, in London, why don't we go to those areas which are suffering? Why don't we go to Afghanistan? Why don't we talk to them? Why don't we tell them? So I think we need to go and we need to work on the ground. Those people's participation is very necessary. So you think at the moment that politics and activism is not near enough to the grassroots of the people that they're talking about? Yes, because those people are ignored. And if you keep them ignored, and if you don't look at them, then they become extremists. So that is the reason that we are speaking up for our rights. We are speaking about women's rights, about women's, uh, girls' education. We are speaking about human rights. But we're not going to those areas in which women are deprived of their rights. So that's what I want to do. I want to go there. I want to speak up. And I want to tell those societies or everyone in that society to respect women, to give them the opportunity to go forward. To, I want to tell every parent that let your daughter to go to school because you are not only sending her to school, you are letting her to build up her future. Well, well I, I was going to ask you about this business between, you know, you're, you are already a world leader. I mean, you didn't choose to be quite so quickly. The circumstances in which you were suddenly catapulted into world fame are, are horrendous. But here you are and people look to you as a world spokesperson now, at a very young age. People like Aung San Suu Kyi or Mother Teresa, or there are a variety of people who've become iconic figures for the world. When they've actually entered into real politics, had to actually join a political party, had to fundraise for that political party, had to canvass for that political party, had to compromise with that political party, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, it's a very hard world. It's not the same world, necessarily, as, as the campaigner. In, in, uh, have you made that choice, though? Do you want to go into real politics? I want to go to politics, but not now. Because I want to go back to Pakistan, and uh, because usually people join politics when they're quite old. And <laughs> so I think I still have time. And... <laughs> So you do, you do. I want to go there and uh, I want to go back to Pakistan and I would see which political party is really, his, like, which political party really want to help people. And then I'll decide which party shall I choose. And if I don't find a party, then I'll make my own. <laughs> and that's a good idea. Let, let me just kind of take a sideways look at something else for a minute because <laughs> the book talks so beautifully about the area that you come from, the geography, the, the snow, the rivers, the water, the, the, the flowers. And, and it's very lyrical, the book, about the, 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 the love you have for the countryside. Is it an amazing place? Is it a beautiful place? Is it a place that we should visit if times change? I believe in two paradises. One is the heaven that I will get after this world, after this life. And one paradise is on earth, and for me that is Swat. And I love Swat Valley because it is the most beautiful place I have ever seen in my life. When I was in Swat and having a tour to Malam Jabba, to Fizagat, and to enjoy being on those tall mountains and to be on the riverside and to... Um, to have trouts and to enjoy our time. At that time, I was not realizing it's beautiful. But now I do. I miss Swat because there is a feeling in, in my heart that being, I'm being apart from Swat, and that was just a part of my past. And now I can't go back there. There's a feeling in my heart. That's why now I realize that I have missed a very precious uh, place in my, in my life. And the other thing is that I miss those mountains because when I came here to UK, I can't even see small hills. <laughs> <laughs> well, near Birmingham, there's the Malverns. I, I'm not saying they could compete, but no. <laughs> I, I, and of course, you know, we were just saying it's a strange thing to be in a, a large house in Birmingham. Some element of it being a fortress, 
to a certain extent, and having to go to new school and new friends and um, a new climate, etc. Yes. And, it, you know... <laughs> Do you think of this as, I mean, are you going to make your home here for a few years? What, what are your plans? Do you know? No, I'm studying in a very good school, mm -hmm. uh, at Boston High School, and um, I'm studying in a girls' school. There's my father. Yes. So I'm studying, <laughs> I'm studying in a girls' school, and uh, because I was studying in a girls' school in Pakistan, and I'm, I'm quite happy uh, in Birmingham, and I'm hopeful that I'll get used to the weather, and I'll get used to the new culture, the new environment. And, but it's very hard for my mother, because um, she still misses that old Swat. And usually, I describe the beauty of Swat, but to be like, in fact, uh, they're also like a, the stream full of garbage that smells really bad. There's traffic, and there's a People have built houses without any uh, map, and they have just drawn it. And so there are so many things, but still Swat is a beautiful. Do remember this one. <laughs> <laughs> so what I miss Swat, and uh, my mother is really, uh, she's, she sometimes feels very sad because when we finish our food, when we finish our dinner or lunch, the food that is left, my mother said that I can't throw it into the dustbin because she, she thinks of those poor people who used to come to our house and have lunch with us, have, have, their, have some food from our house. So she says that I can't throw the food into the dustbins. So that's why she just gives the food to the birds. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really uh, hard to live in a new society. It would have been very good if we came here for a visit, if we, if we, if we would have come here on our own will. But we are being, being, being forced to, co uh, to, to come here. We are being just, like, thrown here. So that's why, uh, even if you go to a paradise, but if someone just give you, like, if someone just throw you to the paradise, you wouldn't like the paradise, mm -hmm. not at all, because you want to go according to your own will. And that's what, is, that's what we are feeling. That's what we are facing. Yeah, I, I think we, I don't know if we understand, very few people in this room would have experienced any of this but I think that uh, whilst we are very very proud to have you here I, I completely understand that it's terrible to be in exile it's one of the, the, the hardest things to, to do particularly when you can see that your country is suffering and you talk in the book about you, you say that you think that Pakistan is a very unlucky country I mean in your lifetime you've seen it, terrible earthquakes and the rise of fundamentalism in a very savage way, and the floods. And you say you think Pakistan is a very unlucky place. But at the same time, I sense that you want it to have a very different future. But you, you, you even ask whether it should have even come into being. I mean, what's your sense about Pakistan? The thing is that in Pakistan, politicians come, leaders come. There are religious leaders. Every leader makes another group in Pakistan. There's no one to unite those people. A person comes, he tells people, he motivates people about their rights and tells, we will help you, but he creates another party. So then we have parties, 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 parties. We have different parties now, different political parties. We are being divided, divided, and divided. So sometimes I think that instead it would have been better that we were living in the India. If the Pakistan weren't divided, it would have been good because before coming into being, before becoming independent, only Muslims and Hindus were fighting. But we've created Pakistan. Now Shia and Sunni are fighting. Now the Urdu speaking people in Pashtun are fighting. Now the people of Balochistan want to create a new country. We are dividing every day. And you can't imagine, if you listen to people, they would create many, like 40, 50 more countries in Pakistan. The thing is that it is the duty of our government to think about it. They must not focus only on one province, only on one part of the country, and, give, and develop one part of the country. They must also look at the other people. 
if I am living in UK, and if you are here, and if your government is only focusing on London, building schools in London, building hospitals in London, working for people in London, what about the other parts of the UK? This is not development. And that's what we want in Pakistan. We want the government to focus on every corner of our country. Then we need leaders. We need leader not to divide people. We need leader to unite people. You, you were very outraged and aghast when Benazir Bhutto was assassinated. Do you think that she would have been a leader of that nature? She was a great leader. And their party is still a powerful party because poor people support this party. Poor people, the people who are, who are in fields, who are working all the day, who are, who are doing labor, those people can understand what a leader Benazir Bhutto was. And for me, she's an inspiration because she showed me, she gave me an example that a woman can do anything. She became the prime minister of Pakistan. When she came back to Pakistan in 2007, we were really happy. And we said, like, we are going to have a good prime minister for Pakistan. But then um, she was shot. And it spread more fear amongst people. Because we thought that Benazir Bhutto will come, now more women will take part in politics, we will have more women in every profession, in every field. But because of that assassination, it, 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 it spread fear in the hearts of women. Mm -hmm. But still I'm hopeful that if I work hard and if people support me and if we work together, if, we, if I go back to Pakistan and create another, another party, I'm never going to succeed. I'm going back to Pakistan. I'm going to unite all these parties. I'm going to make one Pakistan. We are not going to make any division of Sunni and Shia. We are not going to make any division of Urdu speaking and Pashtuns. We are not going to make any division. We are going to be only one. We are going to be humans and we are going to be one Pakistan. And that's why I'm going back to Pakistan and I'm going to serve Pakistan. In... <laughs> Is this, I've been reading some of the um, sort of unpleasant attitudes that some people are taking in Pakistan to you having a, a world stage role. Um, and is there some difficult path that you have to negotiate between, I'll put it very crudely, the West thinking, oh good, we've got somebody here who will criticize Pakistan with us and yet, actually, you love Pakistan and you want the West to understand how Pakistan has reached the position it's in. Because in your book, again, which I commend, it's very, you're very analytical about the, the different uh, pressures that Pakistan has been put under by, by the West to, do, to serve biddings. So it's a hard road to, fight, to, to walk this. You're trying to criticize Pakistan because you have a right to, and yet defend it against the West who want to criticize it as well. Is that hard? The first thing is that this is very political to say East and West. I believe that, yes, Pakistan has done many mistakes. And the West also has made many decisions with error. You, and you can say mistakes, honestly. Yes. <laughs> You're allowed. <laughs> I believe that now all these countries need to change their ideas. All these politicians need to change their ideas. Some politicians only go for the seat. They only go for, for that for that becoming like president or prime minister. Some politicians go for corruption, for earning money. But the thing is that in many countries, most of the budget, like much of the money is spent 
on the army, on the military forces as well. If we want success, if we want a developed future, we need two, three things. First thing is obvious. We need to give space to women. We need to give them opportunities. We need to accept them. And then, if you talk about politics and if you talk about the governments, all these countries need to focus on education. They, they need to spend much of the budget on education. We think of Pakistan only suffering from terrorism. We think only of Afghanistan. But there are many other powers involved in it. And if all these countries, especially the world powers, if they stop trying to spend their money on the weapons and if they stop sending their weapons to Afghanistan and in Pakistan, if they start sending books, and I ask them, we all ask them, that instead of sending guns, send pens. Instead of sending tanks, send books. Instead of sending soldiers to these suffering countries, send teachers. And I want to change the idea of fighting. We all fight with each other. It's human nature. You can never change this idea. It's our nature to fight. I fight with my brothers. My brothers fight with me. But the thing is that these countries should fight. But the fight and the competition should not be on, on counting how many weapons do you have, how many tanks do you have, who has got atomic bomb and who has got the nuclear power station. This competition must be on the basis of how many educated children do you have. What's the, what's the rate of literacy? We need to change the ideology. We need to tell people what the real power is. You are not powerful if you have a gun because through gun, you can only kill. You are powerful when you have a book, when you have a pen, because through pen, you can save lives. And that's what, and that's the change that we want to bring in our society. Let us change our minds. Let us, let us have war, let's fight, but the fight should be on education. If a country has more children educated, if a country has more talented, People, if a country is given equal rights to each of its citizens, that country is the powerful, not the country with having an atomic bomb. Thank you.